On April 12th of 1981, around 8 o'clock in the morning, Sheila, a 14-year-old girl, walked back to her cabin, cabin 28, from the neighbors at cabin 27. She had been staying the night with a friend. As she walked in, she discovered her older brother and one of his friends laying in pools of blood. She then ran back next door in a panic, and what happened afterwards would be an over 40-year-old mystery still to be solved. Welcome to the Beach House 34 True Crime and Paranormal Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Worth, and this is the story of Cabin 28, better known as the Ketty Cabin Murders. Before I begin, I want to say that this episode may be a bit different, and if you've ever heard another podcast about the Ketty Cabin murders, you may not have heard quite what I'm about to tell you. After I did my usual research, going back to historical information and even what new information I could find, I learned things about this case that I had never, ever heard before. Things that shed a whole new light on the case. As new information came out, I found it's a story that would be entirely suitable for a soap opera. Now, before we get started, if you enjoy listening to this podcast, hit that subscribe button wherever you prefer to listen. It is so appreciated and it allows me to continue to create content just like this. Thank you, thank you. Now, I'm not going to lie. I went back and forth on whether or not to include some of the information that you're about to hear because the information that I found included some theories that stemmed from the released police documents and investigators who had reopened the case years later. I didn't know whether or not to include it, but in the end, decided why the hell not So, enjoy. In September of 1979, Glenna, known as Sue Sharp, and her husband James, known as Jim, who was in the Navy, lived on the East Coast, and they lived there with their five children. Johnny, who was 16, Sheila, who was 13, Tina, 12, Ricky, 10, and Greg, 5. Then. In July of that same year, the two decided to separate. So, Sue packed up all five kids and headed to Northern California, where her brother lived. There are many theories as to why Sue left her husband. Uh, One of them is that he was abusive. But there has never been any documentation to back this up. Another theory is that the two girls were being sexually abused by their father according to an interview done by Sheila, the oldest girl in the Sharp family, and this interview was done very recently, um, there's no proof to back this up either. However, it should be noted that their father, Jim, was in fact arrested and imprisoned later for the sexual abuse of a child. Now, that being said, in both cases, I want to make it clear that just because there's no record of these things this abuse, um, either spousal abuse or child abuse, just because there's no record of these doesn't mean it didn't happen. Not to jump on a soapbox, but there are plenty of times when women are abused or they are aware of abuse happening in their household, but never report it due to fear or other reasons. So that being said, this is not the first time that Sue had left her husband, but it would be the final time. Sue, she's got all these kids in tow. She needs a place to stay. And as she makes her way across the United States, she would end up staying with some friends and some family. One of these family members was actually her husband's parents. She wanted to, again, stay with her sister who lived in Oregon. But Sue had done this before. And this time her sister said, no, sorry, they could not stay there. Now, her brother did live in Quincy, California. This is a town located northeast of Sacramento, had a population of 1,429 people 
at the time. It's right in the middle of the Plumas National Forest within the Sierra Nevada Mountains, so you would imagine it's very beautiful there. Her brother had actually just recently moved to a new place of his own from a small trailer, and it's this trailer that he let Sue and the kids have as their own. So Sue and her five kids moved into this trailer within the Claremont Trailer Park. Now here in Quincy, Sue met a woman by the name of Nina, whose nickname was Mama Meeks, who soon became a very close friend of Sue's. Now, Nina had kids of her own. She had at least three boys, Wade, who was 19, Richard, who was 16, and Walter. And Sue's kids and Nina's kids would often spend time together, but not usually as a group. And what I mean by that is that Sue and Nina were not around. It was usually just the kids left on their own. Now, Sue was usually over at Nina Mama Meek's place, which was not inside this trailer park area while uh, where Sue lived. And Sue just left her kids at home. So uh, over at Mama Meek's then place, those kids would then head over to Sue's trailer and they would hang out there. So literally all the kids are at one location and the adults are at a different location. Further, it was said that Sheila, the 13-year-old, She was often left to look after the kids when her mom wasn't around, which evidently was quite often. But since this seemed to happen a lot, uh, and Sheila didn't want this responsibility of taking care of all these kids, she would lock the kids out of the trailer and stay inside and watch television. Now, during this time, Sue, she's now in Quincy, she's in this trailer, Sue has a new guy in her life. His name is Randy Sharp, and no relation. Even he said that Sue wasn't a great mom and that whenever he would call Sue's place, it was always the kids who answered with Sue not even being home. Now, somehow, and this likely from Mama Meeks, uh, Sue learned of a program called CETA, CETA, and it stood for the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. Now, at the time, this was a program whose goal was to help people struggling to find work. And if you participated in this program, you could earn money while you also learned new skills. So Sue decided to enroll herself in a class, and all these classes were held at nearby Feather River College. It seemed to be a step in the right direction for Sue, right? But evidently, she only lasted there about two quarters. Her income at the time was she was getting $250 a month from Jim's paycheck. She was getting government assistance, and she worked as a part-time dishwasher at the Quincy Elks Lodge. Now, this is supposedly where she met Randy Sharp. However, shortly after meeting Randy, she lost her job at the lodge. Now, in the meantime, while all this is going on, there's another story happening. And this story is about a couple by the name of Marty and Marilyn Smart, along with Marilyn's kids. In March of 1980, Marilyn and Marty Smart, along with Marilyn's 12-year-old son, Justin, and her other child, moved into cabin 26 in Keddie, California. And this is about seven miles away from Quincy. Now, Marty had begun to work for the Ketty Lodge, and part of his compensation was a place to live. It was a no-brainer. Back in Quincy at the Sue Sharp household, things are kind of starting to go a little bit sideways. 13-year-old Sheila, Sue's oldest daughter, became pregnant, and the father was believed to be one of the Meeks brothers. There was a lot of controversy, actually, about who exactly was the father of this child. Both Sheila and the Meeks family always said it was Richard Meeks, who was three years older than Sheila. However, it was believed to be that it was Wade, the younger brother, who was the father. So Sue, she's still in Quincy. She now has her oldest daughter, Sheila, pregnant. And her four other kids are all stuck inside this tiny trailer, and they need something bigger. So Sheriff Thomas of the Plumas County Sheriff's Office, he currently resided in Keddy at Cabin 28. But sometime around October 
of 1980, he had decided to move back to Quincy. Now, a weekly newspaper called the Feather River Bulletin had an ad that said there would be a moving sale at Cabin 28. During all of this, there is a point in time here that Sue met Marilyn and Marty Smart. Now, it's not quite clear how, but somehow the Meeks also knew the Smarts, and somewhere along the way, they all got to know one another. It is guessed that they all met at Feather River College, where they were all taking advantage of this program. So the bottom line here is that Sue became friends with Nina Mama Meeks, who knew Marty and Marilyn Smart, and they all end up getting to know one another. This, however, also led to Sue having an affair with Marty. So Marty and Marilyn are in Ketty at Cabin 26. Remember, he works, this is his compensation package, essentially, because he works there at the lodge in Ketty. Marty and Sue began an affair not long after they first met, and now this sheriff is leave, leaving Cabin 28, which becomes open for rent. Remember, they're in 26. Here's 28 that's opening up. Sue needed a place, and it was either Marty or Mama Meeks who found out about Cabin 28 opening up and told Sue about it. Sue jumped at the chance. Now, if you really theorize about it, you'd think that it was probably Marty. Here's an open cabin, two doors away from where he lives, and his mistress is looking for a home. So Sue had sent Sheila. So Sheila, she, remember, she's pregnant. Sue had sent Sheila off to her aunt's house in Oregon. And Sue then and her other four kids then moved into cabin 28. Now, Sue's new cabin, it wasn't very big, but definitely better where, than where they were living. The cabin had a living room just inside the front door, and a kitchen was just past that living area. There were two bedrooms along a hallway on the right. Now, the cabin also had a basement, which could only be accessed from the back side of the house, and this is where her oldest son, Johnny, made his bedroom. The thing is, though, is that Johnny, the only way he could get into this room was by stairs that were outside that went into the basement. So Johnny, when he had to use the bathroom or have dinner with the family, he had to leave up the stairs in the back of the house, out of the basement, walk around the house to the front door, and then enter that way. Now, the two younger boys shared the bedroom toward the front of the house, and 12-year-old Tina had one bed while Susan slept in a twin bed in the far back bedroom. So it is said that Sue and Marty's affair continued and they would often meet at a place called the Backdoor Bar. Now, this bar, you're probably picturing it the, the way that I did initially, like a small bar just there in town. This bar was actually in the basement of the Ketty Lodge, which happened to be just downstairs from where Marty was working. So pretty convenient. Now, Mama Meeks, she and Sue had been friends you remember, for quite some time. She knew exactly what was happening between Sue and Marty, but she never said anything to Marilyn. At least, at the time, she never said anything. Now, if this wasn't enough drama, it is said that one of Ketty's landlords was having an affair with the then-sheriff, Sheriff Doug Thomas. Just like Marty and Sue, this woman and the sheriff also met at this backdoor bar. Now, how seriously, how no one could not notice this and figure out what was going on in a small town really sounds like a bunch of bullshit to me, right? I mean, doesn't it? So remember, the sheriff used to live in number 28, cabin 28, before Sue and her kids lived in, moved in. Marty and Marilyn also had been at number 26 for some time. And, of course, it's heavily rumored that the uh, smarts were actually into drug dealing. So you think, well, come on now. Surely the sheriff knew this was happening, right? Well, there's no proof of that. But what is known is that the sheriff and Marty became very close friends. So close that they often spent time together by cruising around in the sheriff's squad car. 
And, oh, yeah, we haven't yet even talked about Cabin 25. Cabin 25 was the home of the landlords at the time. You know, the same landlord that's having this affair with the sheriff. So we've got the landlords in number 25. Marilyn and Marty and Marilyn's kids, including 12-year-old Justin, in number 26. And just before moving out, the sheriff was in number 28, which is, of course, now Sue's place. So around February of 1981, there's a lot of moving parts happening in Ketty. The landlords in number 25 had gotten fed up with the drug dealing that they knew was happening in the area, and they ended up evicting some tenants. Now, this same month, Marty was fired from his job, and it's not known if it was due to this drug issue or if it was just because he didn't do his job well. But what this also meant was because he was fired, he was now going to lose his place to live unless he paid for it. Otherwise, they'd have to move out by May. Also in February, Sheila was due to give birth in Oregon. So in February, Sue had to head up to her sister's place for the birth and then divvied up her kids amongst her friends, who also included the Meeks. It had been made known that not only did Sheila want to keep the baby, so did Mama Meeks, because she believed that this child was Richard's, and it was her first grandchild. Sue, however, made her own decision. After Sheila gave birth, Sue made the call to give the child up for adoption. So to say that people were unhappy about this decision would be a complete understatement. It is speculated that when Mama Meeks heard about this decision to give this child up for adoption, she was so mad that she told Marilyn that Sue was having an affair with her husband, Marty. So Marilyn then kicked out Marty, and Marty then headed to a friend's place in Reno. A friend by the name of Severin John Boobaday. Now, his nickname was Bo, so we're going to just refer to him as Bo. The thing was, what Marty didn't know was that his wife was having her own affair <laughs> with the 19 year old Wade Ma Meeks. So this kind of worked out for them that Marty took off. This didn't mean that Marilyn wasn't still outright pissed, though. It didn't matter that she, too, was having an affair like her husband. The fact that Marty stepped out on her was unforgivable. So I know there's a lot. You've been thrown a lot of information. So let's just sum up this drama really, really quick. Sue has been best friends with Mama Meeks for quite a while. Sue's daughter, Sheila, ends up pregnant at 13 by one of Mama Meek's sons, supposedly. Sue is also having an affair with Marty, Marilyn's husband. Marilyn is having an affair with another of Mama Meek's sons. And Sue, knowing that Sheila, her daughter, and Mama Meek's want to keep the baby, ends up giving the baby up for adoption. And remember, Sheila, too wanted to keep the baby. Sheila was devastated. It is said that Sheila believed that she would be able to keep the baby, and then the Meeks would then take her in, allowing her to get away from her current family and start a new one. According to records, this is likely what would have happened. Sue, however, made the choice on her own for everyone involved. Now, it should be noted that even 40 years later, Sheila still says the child was Richard's. If only we had a way to prove this, you know, like with DNA testing. Now, remember, all of this happened in February of 1981. In March, it is said that Marty then placed himself into a VA hospital complaining of PTSD. Now, official records say, and statements say that Marty and Bo 
met at this VA hospital, which happened to be in Reno, while Marty was there for treatment. It is said that when Marty was released from the VA hospital, he brought Bo with him back to Ketty, and Bo stayed with Marty, Marilyn, and Marilyn's kids in cabin 26. What we don't know is why Marilyn said, hey, come on back, it's all right, or even what happened with the affair that she was having with one of the Meeks. So when Marty returns to Ketty and he brings Bo, it is said that they have devised a plan to bilk people out of money, essentially through mail fraud. So that's the whole reason that they're there together to work on this plan. The night of April 11th, 1981, Sue is at home in cabin 28 with Tina, 12, her two youngest boys, and their friend Justin, who is also 12. Now, this is the same Justin who is the son of Marilyn Smart. Sheila is staying overnight next door at cabin number 27, the Seabolts. At 8 o'clock in the morning of April 12th, Sheila woke up and headed back home. She opened the front door and saw her brother Johnny and his friend Dana laying there in a pool of blood. Frantically, she ran back to the Seabolts screaming, and the Seabolts didn't have a phone. So someone from the home ran to the lodge to call 911. Now, Sheila is trying to speak and explain what she had just seen. She had not seen her mother, so she's not sure that she's even there. She doesn't know where her younger brothers are or even her younger sister, 12-year-old Tina. Jamie, who is the oldest son of the Seabolts, heads to the window of cabin 28 where he knows the younger boy's bedroom is. And as he looks in the window, he sees that all three boys are still there, and they're all fast asleep. He gradually opens the window and wakes them up and has them crawl out the window of the cabin. Now, it doesn't take long for Deputy Hank Clement to arrive at the cabin. As soon as he opened the door, he saw the carnage, just like Sheila did. Johnny was laying closest to the front door. He was face up his hands bloody and tied together with medical tape. Next was his friend Dina, who was laying on his stomach, his bloody head resting on the corner of a pillow from the sofa. Dana, too, was tied up, but he had been tied with electrical cord. As the deputy walked further into the cabin, he noticed that Sue was laying on the ground next to the couch, and she was covered with a blanket. When he pulled back the blanket, he noticed that Sue was naked from the waist down, and it seemed that she had been moved. Sue had been gagged with a blue bandana and her panties. Medical tape was covering her mouth and she had obvious defensive injuries to her arms. So when investigators later arrived, they too felt that Johnny and Dana, like Sue, had also been moved because there were large pools of blood on the floor where it appeared they had been killed, but this is not where their bodies ended up. As if the scene wasn't bad enough, blood was found on the wallpaper in the living room. It was found on the ceiling on the furniture, on both bedroom doors, so this means where the boys were sleeping and where the girls were sleeping, and the handrail outside the back door. A further walkthrough of the cabin also showed some blood on the bedding in the back bedroom. Now, this is the place where Sue, Sheila, and Tina usually slept. There were even knife marks in the walls themselves. Sue's bare feet and one of the boy's shoes were also covered in blood, and this indicated that at some point they were mobile and they stepped in blood before ending up at their final resting spot. All of the victims had sustained blows to the head with what appeared to be a hammer. They were also stabbed, some of them repeatedly. Sue's head even showed an imprint that matched the butt of a Daisy Powerline 880 
air rifle. Sue and Johnny both had their throats cut. Dana had multiple head injuries and had been strangled. It was apparent that there had been a struggle, and because Johnny had suffered so many injuries, it was believed that he was attempting to help his mom. After the autopsies were conducted, it was learned that there wasn't just one hammer involved in the crime, but two. One of the hammers were found still inside the cabin, while the other one was missing. Inside the cabin, they also located a knife that had been severely bent. As horrific as this entire scene was, there was one thing that was even more disturbing. Tina, the 12-year-old, was missing. A massive search for Tina was started. Posters were hung, an APB was put out by the police, and the FBI was called in. Because Tina was missing, at first, the police believed that she was the reason for the crime, that someone had targeted Tina, and the others had just gotten away, and they fought back. Volunteers and law enforcement combed the area. They checked homes and the forest area around the cabins. People walked on foot throughout the area within a mile's radius of the Cabin 28. Jeep posses combed every trail they could within a five-mile radius, and still Tina could not be found. They find out that Tina's male teacher had a photo of Tina at his home. Major, major creepy vibes, right? Tina's teacher had happened to be at the Ketty Bar the night of the crime. However, he too was cleared. But if you thought that the police might have been onto something, being as he had a photo of Tina at home, you would be right. Not long after he was cleared, he moved away from the area. And a few years later, he was actually arrested for the assault of a seven-year-old child. As I was investigating this crime, I happened to come across a photo of this teacher whose picture was shown in a local paper along with other men, not for crimes or not for anything bad, but being listed as the most eligible bachelors in the area. I will put that photo up on Instagram for you if you want to take a look at that. Now, the search for Tina was ongoing, and police were hitting dead end after dead end. In the meantime, everybody is being questioned. Several people who knew the Sharps were questioned, and so many different timelines were established that it was hard to keep up with them all. That being said, here is what is believed to be the actual timeline. Around 1.30 in the afternoon, Sue and Sheila, her oldest daughter, went together to go pick up Johnny and Dana from a local park in Quincy and bring them back to Ketty. After they're back in Ketty, Johnny and Dana, sometime between 2.30 and 3.30 in the afternoon, decide to hitchhike back to Quincy. So the next time that Johnny and Dana are seen it's at the Doris Foster Home in Quincy, and this is around 5.30. Now, the Dorises are where Dana, Johnny's friend, currently lives. At around 6 o'clock, they ask the Dorises if Dana could spend the night with Johnny at Cabin 28, and they agree, but they both have to find a ride rather than hitchhike their way there. The next time that the two were seen... It was at 6.30 at a woman named Kathy's apartment. She is a 27-year-old woman that evidently Dana, all of 17 years old, had been involved with. She didn't want to drive them back to Ketty. Now, people were questioned about where they may have seen Johnny and Dana in Quincy, and it was mentioned that it was near this gas station in Quincy. They appeared to be trying to find a ride back to Ketty. Now, Kathy, it just so happened, lived just behind this gas station where the two boys had been seen hitchhiking. So it's believed that this is where they went after Kathy said that, no, she would not drive them back. 
They didn't have any luck getting a ride. And so they went back to Kathy's where they just begged. It's like, please, 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 we need to get back. She finally agreed to see if a friend of hers would take them. The friend did agree, and all of them kind of hung out at Kathy's place while they waited for the friend to show up. When Kathy's friend did end up dropping them off back in Ketty, it was very late that night. She had mentioned to police how incredibly dark it seemed around cabin number 28 and that there was only this really dim light coming from inside the cabin. And she described it as being pretty eerie. She felt uncomfortable. Now, here's where a few other timelines come into play. Mama Meeks is said to have told the police that the entire Sharp family, all of them, every single last one of them, including Dana, were all at the Meeks house the entire day, from morning to late afternoon, playing cards and board games. According to her, Sue and her family left around 6 o'clock at night, which we know is not true. Richard Meeks, one of Nina's sons and the supposed father of Sheila's child, said that Johnny spent Friday night with him, and then they met up with Dana at a location on Saturday morning. From there, they then went to someone else's house where they drank beer and listened to music. Richard then said that Johnny and Dana left this house at 3 o'clock, which again, we know is not true because Johnny and Dana were in Ketty at this time. So at this point, we've got what we believe to be the actual timeline of Dana and Johnny, and then what two people from the Meeks family are saying, giving differing versions of where the boys actually were. So let's take a look at the evening before the murders, because while this is going on, you know, during the day and like where Johnny and Dana are coming and going from Ketty to Quincy, there's actually a lot going on that evening prior to the murders happening. We know that Sue is in her cabin late that afternoon with Greg, 5, Ricky, 10, and Justin, 12, Marilyn's son. Sheila, at the time, 14, and Tina, are both next door at cabin number 27, the Seabolts. This cabin, it should be noted, is only about 15 feet from cabin number 28. Sheila and Tina have dinner at the Seabolts, while Sue, Greg, Ricky, and Justin have dinner inside cabin 28. Around 8 o'clock, Sheila walks from cabin 27 into her own cabin at cabin 28 and says she needs to get pajamas to wear. She was going to spend the night with her friend in cabin 27. Sheila then grabs her clothes and heads back to the neighbor's place. Now, some theories are that before she went back to the Seabolts, Sheila turned off the outside light of the cabin. Now, if you remember, Kathy's friend who had dropped off Johnny and Dana, had mentioned how dark it was around the cabin that night. And your first thought was probably like mine, was like, well, so what? Everybody has a habit of switching on or off lights as they enter or leave someplace, right? Here's the thing about this light, though, outside of cabin 28. It's evidently far more important than just a simple outside light of a cabin. The switch on this for the light on cabin 28 was very important. And it goes back to the days of the railroad workers who used to come through Ketty years ago. Now, this switch was also attached to a light that then illuminated the center of a street, and it allowed the railroad workers to be able to see their way from the railway station to the lodge where a coffee shop was open all year round. But that was years ago. The railroad workers no longer walked that section of the road to get to the coffee shop. So, yes, the light was important then, but maybe not as important in 1981. It's unknown if Sue was actually required to keep this switch on or not. So, bottom line is, we have Sheila maybe or maybe not shutting this light off on purpose. 
Another interesting thing that is theorized is that not only did Sheila turn off this light, she unscrewed the light bulb itself so that in the event someone hit the switch back on, nothing would happen. So she's heading back and she goes back to number 27 where she's staying the night. And times vary on this next portion. But there are two things that may have happened early that evening. So first, remember, Tina was also next door at the Siebold's. And Tina realized it was late and she was not staying overnight. So she headed home at around 9.30 p.m. Now, remember, Sheila had just been home to gather her things around 8 o'clock and went back to the Siebold's. Now, the second story is that when Sheila did go back to cabin 27 with her things for bedtime, she told Tina that mom, Sue, wanted her home, wanted Tina home by 10 o'clock, which actually was very out of character for Sue to ask Tina to come home. But what was strange about all of this was that Tina very typically was the one who stayed both Friday and Saturday nights at the Siebold's. It was right next door. Sheila usually didn't. Now, it could have been that maybe the Seabolts just didn't want an extra child in the cabin along with Sheila and their own children. I could see that. But it was strange that Sheila was sleeping there and not Tina. And we all know kids, right? Or most of us had early. <laughs> you know, we all were kids at one point in time. So I'm thinking that you know, along the storyline with Sheila walking over saying, hey, Tina, you're supposed to go home. Tina didn't just walk into her house all content or anything. She likely asked her mom why she needed to come home. It's obviously not known what was said, but in my head, I can picture this conversation. Tina, she's upset that Sheila gets to do something that she very typically does. And Tina then asking her mom why she had to come home. And then if her mom is saying, well, I didn't ask you to come home, then why didn't Tina just head back to the Seabolds? So anyway, it's at this same time that all this is going on that Johnny and Dana are still trying to get back to Ketty from Quincy. So in cabin 28, around 10 o'clock, the younger boys got tired and headed to the front bedroom for the night. Around 11 o'clock to midnight, Sheila, who was staying at the night in cabin 27, also went to sleep. Now, one of the original stories was that Johnny and Dana, sometime between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m., hitchhiked their way back to Ketty. But we know this isn't true because they had gotten a ride. They were, in fact, dropped off around 11 to 11.30 p.m. It, in one story, it's also said that Johnny and Dana finally, when they finally got to the cabin, they went in the front door, hung out for a while upstairs, and then decided to head down to Johnny's room in the basement. And remember, they had to go outside to get to the stairs that would take them to Johnny's room. Another story, though, would surface a little later when 12-year-old Justin, who was staying overnight, at the Sharps house in cabin 28, decides to speak. So anyway, while this is going on, in the meantime, there's some things happening at the local bar there in Ketty. Marilyn, Marty, and Bo were all at the Ketty bar the night of the murders. However, what seemed very weird was that Marilyn was wearing a long floor-length dress, and Marty and Bo were both wearing three-piece, very dated suits, along with mirrored sunglasses. Now, the story goes that as soon as the DJ that night switched from country music to rock music, they didn't like it, they got angry, and they left the bar. They all head back to Cabin 26 where Marty then calls the bartender to complain. And evidently things were set right, and he and Bo returned to the bar later, while Marilyn was, of course, with them at the beginning. She decided to stay home once they got there. According to police records, no one that night 
Marilyn, Marty, or Bo could keep the story straight when it came to this music problem, who got mad at whom or what. However, all three of them made sure to mention this issue. Regardless, all three of them left the bar, headed back to cabin 26. This is when the phone call, sorry, alleged phone call, was made to the bar to complain about the music. Here's the thing, though. There doesn't seem to be any mention in records about the police actually heading to the bar and asking if this information about the music was true or not. We do know that Marty and Bo left the bar just after 1 o'clock in the morning. Now, I found this interesting, and I'll get to this here in just a second. I did some initial research, and I did find that like today, at least in most places, bars close at 2 o'clock in the morning. This was also true in 1981. So the story was that Marty and Bo left after 1 o'clock in the morning, went home, called the bar, complained, and then headed back. So at most, this would have given them very little time to continue drinking at the bar. But there's always the possibility that in a small town like Ketty, with the sheriff often at the bar himself, that this rule might not have always been enforced. But considering that it was during spring break for the students, the town of Ketty was relatively quiet, and it's unlikely that many people were even in the bar at all. The bar owner actually even chose to have a DJ instead of a live band, like they usually do, because the students weren't there. He knew they weren't going to be busy. So nonetheless, the theory is that when Marty and Bo and Marilyn all come back to Cabin 26, it wasn't to call the bar and complain about music, but rather to change their clothes and gather the items they'd need to commit the murder of Sue. Then they went to Sue's, murdered three people, and possibly four, if you consider Tina at the moment, she is missing, and then cleaned up before heading back to the bar. So seriously, this actually makes zero sense. Let's say the bar did close at 2 o'clock in the morning. It is said that they headed back to the bar, but how long would the murders have taken? And we know that Tina was abducted, right? They would have even had to deal with Tina as well, and they did all this within an hour. It just does not make any sense. So the items, just so you know, that they grabbed were said to be three rolls of white medical tape, several knives, Marty's hammer, and a Daisy 880 pellet rifle. So, of course, the police are still investigating this whole scene. And because the police department did know that they were very overwhelmed having to investigate this crime and still keep up their regular patrols, Sheriff Thomas asked for help from the Department of Justice in Sacramento. And they ended up sending two investigators from the Organized Crime Unit. So why would the Organized Crime Unit show up? Doesn't that seem strange? It's said that Sheriff Thomas specifically called to have this unit to come to Ketty. So Marilyn is brought in and questioned by these two investigators, and she tells them that the night of the murders, evidently Bo had asked Sue to go out with him, and Sue said no. She also said that that same night that they're all at the bar, that Bo happened to say that he, quote, felt like killing someone. So obviously, Marilyn is sitting there pointing the finger at Bo. Marty and Bo were then brought in for questioning, and by these um, investigators from the Department of Justice, the organized crime unit, and if that wasn't weird enough, these two investigators questioned both Marty and Bo, both of them, at the same time, in the same room. Now, Bo, he sat there and he claimed to be a former police officer. Not true. He did serve in the Air Force, however. Uh, during the time that he was a quote-unquote police officer, he claims that he was shot in the groin during a robbery. Now, while it is true that he was involved in a robbery, it was a robbery with his uncle, and his uncle is the one who was shot in the groin. 
But the reason he brings this up is that he wants to make the point that this being shot in the groin business made him impotent and therefore he wouldn't have had any interest in Sue because of this. Now, Bo, it turns out, has an extensive criminal history. The man that he claims as his father, even though there was no blood relation or even an adoption, was known to be involved in organized crime in Chicago. He raised Bo and he mentored him. Bo was also known to visit Vegas frequently and moved in the circles of those who were heavily connected with the distribution of drugs and money. There were also rumors that Bo was far more involved and possibly hiding out, maybe in witness protection, when the murders happened. Not exactly the best way to lay low, is it? So I guess this answers the question as to why the organized crime unit was brought in, but it still doesn't answer a lot of other questions, does it? Like, for instance, why did the sheriff know to call the organized crime or organized crime unit from the Department of Justice? And why was Bo even there in Ketty at all? Marty didn't mean anything to these investigators, but Bo evidently did. So as they're still questioning them, again, together, in the same room, Marty makes a statement to the investigators when they ask him about the fact that his stepson, Justin, was actually there staying the night in Cabin 28 when the murders happened. Marty says that Justin could have just been there without Marty even knowing, which, yeah, I guess, you know, I can see that. That might be true. Not only that, Marty then goes on to say he understands that a hammer was used in the murders and that, ironically, a hammer was missing from his own home. And he goes on to describe it perfectly. So you'd think that there'd be red flags all over the place, right? Yeah, evidently not enough for the investigators. None of this was actually investigated at all. Marty and Bo were allowed to leave, and they did. They went all the way to Nevada. They were never re-interviewed. Is that just crazy or what? Now, Sheila, Sue's 14-year-old, was also questioned by the police. And she was asked what her family was doing on the day before the murders. Now, Sheila, she backed up what Mama Meeks had said, that everyone was at the Meeks house that day. But then her story changed. Now she said that after she and her mom had dropped off Rick and Justin at a ball field, Sheila, her mom Sue, and Greg then all went shopping, and then Sheila was then dropped off at a friend's house in Quincy. Sheila then said that on their way back to Ketty, after picking up Justin and Rick from the ball field, they saw Johnny and Dana hitchhiking and pick them up. A later interview with young Ricky, who again was 10, said that when they got back home, Johnny and Dana were not there. They had already been in cabin 28 when Johnny and Dana showed up. Now, this is the first time that Johnny and Dana would have arrived at Cabin 28 before then deciding around 3 o'clock to go back to Quincy. What is known is that Johnny, Sue, Justin, and Dana were all back at the cabin before noon. Johnny and Dana helped Sue out with yard work, changed, and then went back to Quincy. So in the meantime, Johnny and Dana make it to Quincy. And the next time they're seen is at 5.30 that afternoon at Dana's foster home, the Dorises. This was mentioned before and seems to be the most reliable time. Now, as all of this questioning is going on, the search for Tina continues. The search actually did still continue until mid-April when it was discontinued after not locating her. So let's get back into some of the investigation. So remember that while the crime was taking place, there were still children asleep in the house, and they were all unharmed. This told police a couple of things. 
One, that the suspect or suspects knew the family. I mean, the crimes did seem very personal, didn't they? And that maybe the kids had saw, seen, or even heard something. So they questioned 10-year-old Ricky and 5-year-old Greg. Each of them said they didn't see or hear anything. But remember, though, that they had a friend staying the night, 12-year-old Justin, which happened to be Marilyn's son. So they bring him in to see if he remembers seeing or hearing anything. This is when Justin tells them about a dream that he had, but he can't remember a lot of it. So in an attempt to get Justin to recover this dream from his memory, they decide to hypnotize him. Here's the thing, though. The person doing this hypnosis at the time was the local sheriff, Sheriff Thomas. He had been to a grand total of two, two training sessions to learn about how to hypnotize someone and felt for some reason that he was qualified to perform this hypnosis on a child, no less, and one that had potentially witnessed a horrific crime. While Justin was hypnotized, however, he said he remembered being on a boat. Two men were fighting with Johnny and Dana, and they ended up getting thrown overboard. He then said one of the men had a pocket knife and cut Sue in the chest. He also said in his other hand the same man had a hammer. So while this wasn't much to go on, they felt they needed to get more from Justin in regards to this dream that he had. Now, this time, Justin was taken to Los Angeles and hypnotized by a psychologist at the Children's Hospital. And in this version, Justin mentioned Tina. He said Tina woke up, walked out into the living room, and had been carrying a blanket. A man then grabbed Tina and took her out the back door. He then came back in and grabbed a knife that was sticking out of the wall picked up the blanket that Tina had dropped, and then left. He mentions something, though, about people he saw on the boat. The two of them, one had long, black, greasy hair, combed back with sunglasses, and another one had dark blonde hair with very dark sunglasses. He mentions something about a man taking tape from his pocket and one of the men calling Mrs. Sharp, Sue. So for some reason, Justin, just 12, remember, evidently takes a polygraph test and tells the examiner that he did not have a dream. He actually saw the whole thing. In this new version, he said he woke up to a noise and went to the doorway and looked out into the living room. He saw Sue on the sofa and two men with the same descriptions as before standing in the middle of the room. Then, Johnny and Dana walk in the front door. Johnny argues with the man, and a fight happens. Dana then tries to run towards the kitchen when the brown-haired man hits him with a hammer. Sue then runs over to Johnny. The men then tied up Johnny and Dana. Tina then comes out of the room and asks what's going on. Two men run over to Tina and grab her by the arms and take her out the back door. She is yelling for help. Later, the brown-haired man comes back and covers up Sue with a blanket. Justin then said Sue was cut in the middle of her chest by a black-haired man using a pocket knife. Justin then said he got back into bed and covered himself with the blanket where he fell asleep in about an hour. In the meantime, Law enforcement is combing the scene of the crime, looking for anything. Reports and photos measuring over a foot thick were now in the file for the crime, and it was still growing. Pieces of the cabin walls, the carpet, the floors, they were broken up and taken in as evidence. The kitchen and bathroom drains were also inspected, and Tina still has not been found. Now remember, though, that there was mention of two hammers being used in the crime, and only one of them was at the scene. The other one was missing. The police never search for the missing hammer. Later, a new Plumas County Sheriff, 
would say that even before the murders, the residents had very little trust or confidence in the sheriff's department. After this horrible crime and the botched investigation of it, this trust was all but broken completely. As of May of 1981, more than 150 pieces of evidence had been collected, but they wouldn't release all of the content that they found within the home, especially that of some quote-unquote tiny item that could be the break in the case. And as far as weapons go, they recovered a steak knife, a butcher knife, and a hammer. The residents of Ketty, who before felt themselves very, very safe, and routinely kept their doors unlocked, are now bolting themselves in at night. Many did choose to stay in Ketty, but others chose to move away. So in May 1981, as they're still gathering this evidence from the house, the composite sketches that were done of the men that Justin had described are released to the press and say that, hey, they're wanted for questioning. These sketches, like I said, were largely based on what Justin had said when he had his dream. Nothing came of it. Some interesting information did come out, though, later. And it was later determined that these murders had actually been premeditated. And the reason that this date was chosen was for two reasons. The first was that it was spring break for the college students, so not a lot of people would have been in the area. This meant fewer witnesses. We talked about this before, where the DJ was at the bar instead of there being a live band. It was also a special day for Marty in particular. Now, Marty evidently had two birthdays. His real birthday was on May 11th, but in order to sign up for the military, he said that it was a month earlier on April 11th. It was very typical that Marty would celebrate his fake birthday and his real birthday with parties and friends and usually at the local bar. So the night of April 11th, 1981, Marty was indeed at the local bar celebrating. The suspects also knew that very few people would be inside cabin 28 that night. Weekends in cabin 28 that were very normal were A, Tina usually spent both Friday and Saturday nights at the Seabolts next door at cabin 27, and it was very rare that Johnny was home at all on the weekends, usually choosing to just stay in Quincy. The only people that usually would be in cabin 28 on the weekends were Sue, Sheila, and the two younger boys, Ricky and Greg. Now, the suspects did not know that Justin, Marilyn's son, was actually at Cabin 28 that night. At least this is the story. Justin's mom, Marilyn, also did not have a great reputation for taking care of her child, and Justin had evidently been at the Sharps' cabin for two days in a row, which also included Friday night. And this is important because Friday night happened to be Justin's 12th birthday. But instead of spending it with his family, he was instead at a friend's house all weekend. So what about Sheila? Well, Sheila, as we know, stayed overnight at the Seabolts and was the one to walk into the scene in the morning. Now, evidently, Sheila had never stayed over at the Seabolts before. This is something that Tina did quite often, but not usually Sheila. As Sheila has said she and the neighbor, Alyssa Seabold, had become close friends, and maybe they had. But remember, Sheila had been in Oregon up until February when she had the baby. Then she came back to Ketty to live in Cabin 28. This means that her friendship with Alyssa would have grown quite quickly, which isn't strange. It very well may have. But the thing is, we likely know that the main suspects are Marty and Bo at this point, but the sheriff let them go, and they left the state. When the current police department at the time, led by Sheriff Thomas, had exhausted all of their leads and no one was arrested, the case went cold. In 1984, three years to the day of the murders, a man is out searching the wilderness for bottles 
over 70 miles away from the crime scene. Seems legit, right? Who doesn't walk into some woodsy area looking for bottles? <laughs> he then stumbles across something, and when he looks down, he happens to notice it's a skull. He gets back into town and calls 911. It turns out that he has found Tina's remains. Now, remember, the case is still cold at this point in time. Nothing happens to it until 2013. It wasn't until 2013 that the case was reopened by the new sheriff, Sheriff Greg Hagwood. Now, not only was this an unsolved case, it was also personal to him. Hagwood happened to be in his third year in office. The murders of Sue, Johnny, Dana, and Tina still haunted him because he had actually gone to school with them and he knew them personally. He knew he had to resurrect this case. And he asked a private investigator, a man named Gamberg, if he'd like to take over the investigation. Now, Gamberg also knew the two boys. He had been their coach in martial arts and other activities. Dana happened to be at his house just before the day he died. Now, Gamberg hits this evidence room and pulls all the information about the case and finds nothing was organized. The history log, which should show who did what and on what date, is nowhere to be found. Now, much of the physical evidence from the cabin is still in storage. The living room carpet, the wallboard, and other items that had blood on it, and other evidence. But this, too, is disorganized. Some of the evidence in storage had been contaminated, and some of it that was placed in a freezer to preserve it was no longer any good because someone had shut the freezer off. Now, one bag of evidence was found that had never been opened and never entered even into the evidence log. One of these pieces of evidence was a handwritten letter that was postmarked 16 days after the killings. And it happened to be from Marty to Marilyn. And the letter is asking Marilyn to repair their damaged marriage. In the late letter, it states, quote, I've given it to you. I've paid the price of your love, and now I've bought it with four people's lives. You tell me we are through. Great. What else do you want? The letter was then sent to the Department of Justice, and they were able to get DNA from it, and the DNA was, in fact, from Marty. Not exactly proof but it sure raises eyebrows, doesn't it? Now, another piece of evidence, again, never opened, was a cassette tape. And this cassette tape contained the 911 call of when Tina's skull was discovered in Butte County. And this was from an anonymous caller that said they had found this skull and some bones in a spot known as Camp 18. According to the research done on the Keddy28.com website, even though Marty and Bo had left Plumas County after they had been interviewed by the Department of Justice, it is known that Marty allegedly lived in Paradise, California, about 70 miles west of Ketty. And interestingly, this is also located within Butte County at the same time the 911 call came in. So Gamberg this private investigator in 2013 now, thinks that this tape was deliberately ignored when it arrived at the Plumas County Sheriff's Office. He also discovers that Bo did in fact serve time for armed robbery in Statesville Prison in Joliet, Illinois, and additionally, he also served time in California. His theory about Tina is also that he believes that someone saw Tina when she walked out grabbed her, took her down the back stairs, and then killed her right away. Lastly, and really interestingly, it was also discovered that Marilyn Smart moved out of Cabin 26 the day the murders were discovered. So in 2016, someone happened to be attending a wedding in the Ketty area, and one of the women there had lost a ring. 
So the man returned with a metal detector in an effort to recover this ring. While looking for the ring, he discovered a hammer in the dried up pond near this resort entrance. He left the hammer and eventually contacted the webmaster of the Keddy28.com website, who in turn then contacted the private investigator, Gamberg, saying, hey, I found this hammer. So Gamberg and this man went to the pond. Now, by this time, it was full of water, but they did manage to recover the hammer, and it matches the physical description of the one that Marty Smart said he lost. Also found in this pond was a hunting knife. Now, in 2016, Sheriff Hagwood, the new sheriff, remember, is quoted as saying, there are people locally who know more than they've said. And I believe we've identified some of them and we know who they are and we know where they are. And I have every confidence that they either participated after the fact or they have firsthand information. It's obviously a worthwhile pursuit. There is not an expiration date on homicides. And to the extent that we have surviving siblings and family members, it is our fundamental obligation to help them understand who did this and why. It is believed that after the cold case was picked up by the new sheriff and Keddy, that Sue was in fact the targeted victim, and that it was premeditated. It is also believed that Marty Smart and Bo, along with accomplices, intended to do great bodily harm to Sue Sharp. The premeditation comes from the fact that medical tape knives, a hammer, and likely that pellet gun were taken to the scene. So in 2018, in April of 2018, new evidence had surfaced about the case. DNA was taken from a strip of white medical tape that was used to bind the victim's hands and ankles and to cover the mouth of one victim. This tape was found on the floor near Sue Sharp at the time of the crime. According to Plumas County Sheriff's Special Investigator Mike Gamberg, this DNA matches that of a known living suspect. He has had this DNA for years, but it wasn't until he obtained some samples to compare it to that he could find a match. Both Gamberg and Plumas County Sheriff Greg Hagwood believe that as many as six people were involved in one capacity or another in the murders or the cover-up. Gamberg understands that even some of the individuals who had the experience to work the crime scene and follow the leads weren't even allowed to do their jobs in 1981. The California Department of Justice was given the case and then didn't follow through. Now, Bo had connections with organized crime in Chicago and two known aliases, at least, now, remember how Marty was going to the VA and he spoke with a therapist? The therapist did turn around and say that Marty had confessed the killings. When he was asked for a motive, he told the counselor that he was convinced that Sue was responsible for Marilyn wanting a divorce. He then told the counselor that he had to kill Tina because she saw the whole thing. I couldn't have a witness. He was then asked about this polygraph test that law enforcement requested he take after soon after the murders. And Marty told his counselor, quote, I beat it. Those things are easy to beat. I was lying and they let me go. The counselor told the current investigator, Gamberg, about this confession. And then he alerted the California Department of Justice at the time. And the counselor was surprised that it didn't even lead to an arrest. He said that he called and asked for the agents working on the Keddy case. And he said that he told them of the confession and was told that the partners would like to meet with him. But when they did, they dismissed his allegations as hearsay. The bottom line is, is that Gamberg says that there's more that links a living person or persons to the crime. 
and neither Sheriff Hagwood or Gamberg were willing to divulge specifics, obviously, on who they were watching. It was well known, however, that Marty was a known player and had cheated on his wife with multiple women, including Sue Sharp. It was also said that Sue was counseling Marilyn to leave her husband because he was abusive and he cheated on her. So how ironic is that? It's believed that Marty learned that the two women were having these conversations and because he was so possessive and jealous, it likely led to him and others heading into Cabin 28 and committing the crimes. Allegedly, they were going to teach Sue a lesson, and they came prepared. Now, Gambert, and remember, Gambert, and remember, this is 2018, has kept an eye on Marilyn Smart. Now, as of 2018, she is still alive, and he knows where she lives. However, and this is just so frustrating. Due to budget cuts in 2018, the case was again put on the back burner. And to top it off, Bo actually ended up passing away in 1988. And Marty passed away in 2006. So even though these two are no longer available, to be questioned. There are still many people alive who may have information. And the fact that they're talking about that they have people in their sites as of 2018 that are still alive, which would totally rule out Bo and Marty at the time, because of course they've already passed, we may actually still see an arrest being made in this entire case at some point. Now, according to Hagwood and Gamberg, they are fanatic. They do know that someone out there knows something. And that's it for this episode. I know it was long, but boy, did it have a lot of information in it. Um, I didn't want to keep it just really basic. As soon as I learned about all of this additional information, it really got interesting. And I know, as usual, it's it's run quite long. I'm going to try and shorten these, these babies up as we get uh, further on. But anyway, I just happened to spend so much time on this and um, just really got into the research on this and found all this information that I thought you would find it kind of interesting, too. So anyway, thank you all for listening. You are all so truly appreciated. I would love, love, love to know your opinions on this case. Uh, if you have any thoughts, ideas, whatever it might be. Leave your comments, if you would, on my YouTube podcast page, as this is where I most frequently visit to read and respond. And I will have the links to, the sh in, to that in the show notes, along with the links for all the resources used for this episode. But anyway, again, I would be really, really interested to hear uh, what you think. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. I will be back very soon with another episode. Talk soon.